Hello, my name is Tamar Friedman, Director of Peer Programs at JFN. And on behalf of Jewish Funders Network, I'm happy to welcome you to today's special lecture and Harnessing the Power of Behavioral Economics with Dan Ariely. I'm so pleased and excited to welcome back Dan, the Israeli-American bestselling author. Uh, and Dan will speak to lessons from behavioral psychology that can inform how we can address major social challenges during COVID-19 and beyond. We'll also share case studies from his work and research that have far reaching implications that can help our own work and funding. Dan is open to answering your questions that may come up during the lecture. So if you have questions, please write them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and we will try to get to as many as we can towards the end of our time together. I will now introduce Andre Spaconi, President and CEO of JFN to further frame today's session and introduce Dan Ariely. Thank you, Andres. Thank you, Tamar, and welcome everybody. Folks are still joining, uh, so welcome. Um, it's a big, big pleasure for me to introduce Dan uh, Ariely, um, who is, as Tamar said, a best-selling author, a researcher um, on, on, on behavioral economics, and uh, somebody whose books have changed my way of thinking and my way of making decisions and analyzing my own behavior. Um, I now can't go to a restaurant uh, without thinking of the opening of his first book, how the menus are built to manipulate your decision making around, uh, around dishes and bottles of wine. Uh, but uh, besides then giving us very good uh, cocktail lines in terms of how you know, companies manipulate our decision making. He's also doing a lot of good in the world by trying to harness the learnings of behavioral economics uh, to uh, produce social change and create social good. And I think that is um, is a great thing for Israel and for the world that somebody like Dan is is bringing his his knowledge and his research to solve. Uh, acute social issues and produce lasting social change. We talked with Dan um, a few months back where he actually shared with us a few, a few tips on how to use the tools of behavioral economics in, in, in managing COVID, in going out of COVID. Uh, and I personally found, them, found that very useful. And now we're gonna talk about um, the issue in a much broader sense the use of these tools to really change society, improve people's lives, and, and, and uh, correct social problems. So without further ado, uh, Dan, the floor is yours. Very good. So uh, nice to uh, talk to all of you uh, again. Uh, last time we ran out of time for Q&A. Uh, this time, if you have questions throughout, uh, just please type them in. I'll try to address them as uh, we go through the lecture and if we or the discussion and if I uh, we don't have time, I'll try to respond to some uh, later. Um, so basically today I uh, want to tell you about uh, this group that I'm a part of called Kaima. And Kaima is a, an organization working in Israel uh, exclusively with the, with the Israeli government. And uh, what we're trying to do is to take uh, big challenges that we get to from the government and uh, try to think about how do we uh, do some high quality research first, understand what some solutions might be, and then try to make some, some changes. And I'll give you a couple of examples of, of uh, how we work. And uh, by the way, we're always looking for uh, partners to join us either in general or for specific projects. So if, if anything uh, is interesting for you, uh, let me know and we can follow up later. Okay, so the first example I want to give you of the research that we have uh, done um, has to do with the question of how do you get more kids and particularly how do you get more girls uh, to study computer science? Uh, this is a problem that every government in the world has, including the Israeli government. And when they first uh, approached us about this uh, question, uh, the, they had a very simple suggestion. They said to us, look, uh, what we're doing is we have these very, very good classes that we give to kids between middle school and high school. It's a six weeks class 
on what we call computer science light. And after these six weeks of classes, uh, the kids are uh, um, enlisting more in studying in high school things that could get them to be computer scientists down the road. They study computer science with a high emphasis, math, uh, physics, and so on. And they said, would you help us digitize those classes? I said, sure, sounds like a good idea because taking a, a physical class and make it into digital, digital and keeping it interesting and effective is not, not that simple. I said, I'd be happy to study it, try and figure out how to do it and then hopefully uh, do it successfully. But I said, uh, do we know that this class even works? Um, and you know, it was one of those things that people said that they believed it worked but when you look deeply, there was no data. So um, I told them I'm happy to digitize it, but before I digitize it, I want to first of all uh, test whether it works. Uh, so I studied that. Uh, we took uh, three middle schools, kids did the test, three other middle schools, the kids did not do the test. And guess what? Um, this class seems to have uh, not been effective at all. Uh, it was actually slightly worse. It was zero effectiveness for boys from the beginning of the class to the end of the class. They showed no more interest in becoming computer scientists. And it actually had a negative effect on the girls, negative effect. And this is the class that the government has been doing for a long time in lots of schools. Uh, Facebook is doing it, Google is doing it, other companies are sponsoring it as well. Um, but it seems to be, nobody seemed to have ever tested it. And when you test it, it seems to be not only not positive, but it seems to be negative for, for young girls. Um, that, of course, was very baffling. Why, why is it negative? So um, I said, let me study it again just to be sure. And this time, not just look at what's happening, but also asking other questions to understand why might it uh, be uh, ineffective. And this time, we also made the experiment better. So there was the group that studied computer science, group that studied nothing, and another group that studied uh, neuroscience, just to have another topic as a control condition. And what did we find? The same result, no effect for boys, negative for girls. But now we had some advantage because we also learned a little bit about the why. Uh, and what did we find? Um, it wasn't that the girls did not feel that they could do it, what's called self-efficacy, their belief that they could actually handle it quite well. No, in fact, their self-efficacy was quite high. They believe they can do it and do it well. What happened was that they thought it's a very, very boring kind of a job. They thought it's a meaningless uh, job. And why? Because the first week of computer science, uh, you're learning how to move a turtle on the screen. Uh, the things you're doing are intrinsic for computer science. They don't show you any meaning, what, what you're going to do with this. And because of that, the girls basically said, this is not the kind of job I want. Uh, the boys, by the way, are quite happy. They said, hey, uh, that's great. You get to move a turtle on the screen and you can get a job doing that. That sounds fantastic. The girls were looking for something else. So what did we do? We moved to a very different approach. We said the barrier is not belief in your own skill. The barrier is not feeling that you're incompetent. The barrier is that you don't think it's a meaningful job. It's a meaningful career. So instead of the six weeks class, we changed the way that the kids were choosing what they're going to study in high school. And we went around and we uh, filmed young people, but particularly young women, as they were doing their daily work, but they were doing work in computer science and education, computer science and health, computer science and design, computer science and, and, and. The meaning did not come from computer science. Computer science was the tool to do something else that was very meaningful. And we got a group of um, uh, middle schoolers who were choosing what they were going to study in high school to go through the system. They were forced in this system to watch the videos and the number of uh, girls uh, that sign up to study in high school, things that had to do with computer science, uh, went up by 25%. Uh, the number of boys went up by much less, but still uh, went up. And that was a big, a big success. 
Now, uh, wh why am I telling this? First of all, I think it's a really interesting experiment by itself. Uh, but the second thing is that it means that when we are trying to get people to change their behavior, we need to understand uh, why they are misbehaving, right? Why, what is the barrier? And only once we understand the barrier at the high level, uh, now we can figure out uh, what we next uh, need to do. Because if we're thinking that the girls, it's all about uh, not understanding what computer science is, uh, we might not uh, get the right answer. If we think it's about feeling that they can't do it, we might get a different answer. Um, by the way, we, we did study another version of a computer science class, uh, one that took a whole year, not just six weeks. And there we found that the class is effective. Why? Because if you have a whole year, a whole school year, by that time, it's not just the beginning, it's not just something very simple and the kids are starting to understand the meaning uh, that uh, this class this class has. Uh, another thing we studied was the role of the parents. Uh, the parents do have a very big role to play, uh, more so uh, in Israel for girls and for boys, but still a very large role in all of those. Uh, and therefore we found that uh, connecting uh, the parents to the class uh, was also very effective. So again, uh, if you understand what are the forces at play, you're better able uh, to, make, uh, to make changes. That's an example of a study that you're trying to figure out what to do. Okay, so that's uh, example number one. Then the second example uh, I, want, I want to give you an example of us trying um, to help people lose their lose some weight uh, as you know obesity is a huge problem everywhere uh, in the world uh, childhood obesity is terrible of course um, and we were trying to figure out a way to get people to lose uh, some weight now imagine you're a social scientist and you think to yourself how are you going to do it what is the best way what are some of the ways to help people uh, lose weight um, and you can say maybe it's about uh, telling them about the long-term effects or um, maybe it's about uh, restricting calories or proposing a specific diet or getting people to exercise. Lots of, lots of ways. Um, how would a social scientist look, look at this problem? So we started by stating a few very obvious points. And uh, the first one is that the struggle uh, to keep weight or lose some weight, it's a daily struggle. And you can't be good five days of the week and uh, lose all control two days of the week, it doesn't work, right? In two days of the week, you can mess up the other five. You have to be good <clears throat> every day. You have to do it every day. And you also have to start first thing in the morning. You can't start after lunch. That's, by the way, what's so tough about uh, weight management and weight reduction is you have to do it every day and you have to start before breakfast. Okay, so that was the first principles. Every day, all day long, start early. The second uh, group of principle was the idea that we need a reminder. You know, if you're hoping that people would think about something for themselves, like uh, wake up in the morning and say, hey, today I want to lose weight, that's not going to happen. Or today I want to recycle, or today I want to keep uh, reducing energy consumption. That's just not going to, uh, not going to work. <clears throat> so we said um, we need to have something that reminds people. You know, we sometimes call it a Trojan horse. And, and we want something physical. You know, the digital world is really amazing, but one of the challenges with the digital world is there's nothing there to remind us. Uh, not notification, we don't pay attention to them anymore. Uh, if you take uh, a physical frame and put the frame with a picture of your kids and you put it on your desk, you'll think about your kids. Or if you send them a frame and you give them a picture with you, they'll think about you. If you wait for people to look through their um, digital photo album, it will almost never happen. There's a lot of value in physical reminders. By the way, Judaism, of course, is a lot about physical reminders, right? Think about the yarmulke, 
I think about the mezuzah, think about a lot of things. There's a lot of things that are, we're supposed to see and they're supposed to remind us of doing something and then we're supposed to do it in, um, in reaction. I mean, if we, if we moved uh, the mezuzah and the yamaka and the Hanukkiah and all of those things to be digital, it will be very, very different. Uh, you see the candles on Friday night, it, it creates some uh, a sense of uh, uh, reminders that you wouldn't have if you just took a picture of candle, uh, your candle holders and put them in your digital folder and, and look at it from time to time, or, or almost never. So, so we said we need a physical reminder. And what's a good physical reminder first thing in the morning? It's either the electrical toothbrush or the bathroom scale. Uh, for all kinds of reasons, we decide on the bathroom scale. Okay, so we say, first thing in the morning, every day, bathroom scale is the physical reminder. We want people to go into the bathroom, look at the bathroom scale, be reminded about their health, and then do something. So we started studying uh, the bathroom scale. And you might say, what is there to study about the bathroom scale? But turns out it's a really interesting process, and there are things to learn. So... Um, so we found three things about the bathroom scale. The first thing, it turns out, it's a really good idea to stand on the bathroom scale every morning. Uh, not so good to stand on it every night, but morning is very good. Now, why is it good to stand on it in the morning and not good to stand on it at night? Not because we weigh less, we do weigh less, but that's not the reason. The reason is if you stand on the bathroom scale in the morning, you remind yourself that you want to lose weight and you eat a little bit less for breakfast. You step up on the scale at night, you go to bed, by the morning you forgot the whole thing. So there's something about this ritual of standing on the scale that is actually incredibly important. By the way, if you could, let's say, measure people's weight automatically, you put a little sensor under the bathroom mat or something like that, that's not the same. You actually want people to step on the scale, think of it for two seconds, that creates a reminder, and then people actually uh, eat a little bit less for breakfast. And, and one more thing I want to say, weight is a game of reducing small amounts of calories for a long time. If, you, if all of us reduced our consumption by 200 calories a day, it doesn't seem like a lot. 200 calories all the time, right? Every two weeks we would lose about a pound. Right? That's just how it counts, but you need to do it um, every day. So you, you step on the scale in the morning, people eat a little bit less for breakfast, you have some, some benefit. The second thing is that weight fluctuates a lot. Weight goes up and down, up and down, up and down in a random function. Uh, why random function? Because it depends on how much salt you had yesterday and how much water you have and uh, whether you went to the bathroom or not. And that is com completely unrelated to your real underlying weight, but it just goes up and down, up and down. For people with standard BMI, this up and down, up and down might be two or three pounds a day. For people who are morbidly obese, it could be up to eight pounds a day. Now, this up and down, up and down has two things that make it difficult. The first thing, it's really confusing. Right? But the second thing is that the up is much more depressing than the down makes you happy. So it's terrible, slightly happy, terrible, slightly happy, terrible, slightly happy. On average, not good news, because the bad side of the news is more alarming than the good side of the news is making us happy. So even somebody doesn't lose their weight on average, just change, stay the same. The unhappiness is higher than the happiness on average, it feels like. Um, bad news and that's why people don't step on the scale and think to yourself how many of you are looking forward to stepping on your scale tomorrow morning i'm guessing uh, not many uh, in and not just because of covid and people have gained uh, weight on average but in general it's not it's not good news okay so that's the second thing right stepping on the scale is good the variance is demotivating and the third thing we found out is that people expect their bodies to change very quickly. Uh, people say to themselves, I have been on a diet since yesterday morning. Uh, I ate nothing but salad and I went for a walk. Like, where are the results? The body takes between eight days to two weeks to process such changes. It doesn't happen quickly. 
but we expect it to happen very quickly. So what happens, somebody goes on a diet for four days and then they skip, step on the scale and their weight went up by half a pound and they get very demotivated. And then they take a break and maybe they have a cheesecake and then the weight goes down a little bit. Very, very confusing and demotivating. By the way, this idea that we expect our bodies to react very quickly is true for other um, illnesses that we've looked at. It looks for cholesterol reducing medication, for blood pressure <clears throat> medication, uh, depression, it, all kinds of things that we expect our body to act very quickly. Uh, and when it doesn't, we get, we get uh, discouraged. Okay, so we said, good to step on the scale every morning. The ups and downs are demotivating. And the fact that the changes happen in the long term, not in the short term, is also demotivating and confusing. So what would you do with those, with those three facts? We said, let's present people with data in lower granularity. Instead of telling people how much they weigh, let's give them the trend of the last three weeks. And the good thing about the trend, it swallows the variance, right? The trend over the last weeks doesn't show you the variance, it just shows you what the trend is. So the first experiment we did was whether we should show a five-point scale or a four-point scale. What do I mean by that? Imagine I said the trend is you're increasing a lot, increasing a little, decreasing a little, decreasing a lot. That's a four-point scale. Up a lot, up a little, down a little, down a little. Or a five-point scale, up a lot, up a little, nothing happened, slightly worse, much worse. The question was, do you need a middle point? Do you want the middle point or not? What do you think? Yes or no? The answer is absolutely yes. Now, why do you want the middle point? Imagine a year. Imagine 52 weeks in a year. And imagine somebody who loses weight for 12 weeks and nothing bad happens for 40 weeks. Is this a successful year or an unsuccessful year? From a health perspective, it's an amazing year. Uh, you know, it, it, uh, kind of I'm 53. At uh, my age, a year that nothing bad happened is an amazing year, right? It, it doesn't have to be good. But if somebody loses weight 12 weeks of the year and 40 weeks of the year, nothing bad happened, that's an amazing year. But unless people code that nothing bad happened as good news, it would feel like most of the year was a failure. Right, so it turns out that you want, we want to celebrate nothing bad happened. We want to celebrate nothing bad happened. It's incredibly important, not just to portray it, but to celebrate that. By the way, it's even worse in things like diabetes. If you think about measuring A1C, for most people, their A1C is just going to get worse throughout life. Now, we hope it will get worse in a slower rate than expected. That's victory. Victory in fighting diabetes for most people is you're just going to deteriorate slower than expected. How motivating do you think this is to just deteriorate slightly slower than expected? Not very motivating. But if we change what we, the expectation, we call the, this zero, and we say, hey, you're, you're, you're better than zero, that's a, that's a motivating issue. Um, Okay, so we tested our system. We, we got about a thousand people in the first study, uh, low income, generally obese. Uh, some people get a regular scale that tells them their weight in decimals. Uh, you know, you're 220 pounds, 0.2. And those people for six months, the study lasted six months, just gained a little bit of weight. Gain, 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 gain. A little bit of weight, 0.3% of their body weight every month. Every month, gain, 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 gain. The people who got our scale with no numbers, no numbers, just the trends in a five-point scale, lost 0.6% of their body weight every month for six months. Lost, 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 lost. Right? And that's great news. Now, uh, here's kind of the, the exciting thing for me as a social scientist. You know, when we... Uh, some of you probably remember we used to have a mechanical scale. 
and we had a mechanical scale that's not wasn't that bad because we didn't know what our weight was exactly it was just in general here's what it was like a thick needle and you didn't know exactly what it was but then we moved to digital age and what we decided to do was to put the display exactly where it used to be and add a couple of decimals to it not necessarily a good idea in fact it's a bad idea the digital revolution is giving us a lot of opportunities but we need to think about this and in the case of a scale we need to say maybe we want to report something else just before because we measure weight in pounds and decimals doesn't mean that that's what we need to report and, and if you think about measurement in general they have three functions accuracy give people data help people understand the relationship between cause and effect and motivate people you can't always have those three. Sometimes they stand in contradiction. For example, with weight, because it fluctuates, it's very hard for people to understand the relationship between cause and effect. In our system, when we ask people later on, what is the effect of you eating less cookies or going more for a walk or all kinds of things like that, people understand the relationship. But with the regular scale, it's very hard to figure it out because you stop eating cookies and you just see the variance and you don't see the trend changing in any way so so the question is if you can't have all of these three accuracy relation between cause and effect and motivation which one do you want and personally for me as somebody who is interested in having behavioral change i'm mostly interested in motivation because i want to help people change their behavior the second thing i care about is understanding the relationship between cause and effect for people to make better decisions should i walk more or should i cut more uh, cookies. By the way, probably the answer is to cut cookies. Um, and then the accuracy is the least thing that I care about. And if it hurts the other two, then I certainly don't, don't want that. So, um, so this is kind of a, a general framework of saying, uh, how do we think about, about data in general and what do we want to represent? Now, uh, right now we're just starting a new a new project uh, based on those principles that have to do with how do you grade kids in school. Now, uh, when we give grades, let's say in Israel, it's on a 100 point scale, we give people grades. You got 78 on this exam, 82, whatever it is. Um, and here's the question. Uh, imagine, imagine that we have uh, a kid who is a C student. And this uh, kid who is a C student would always get, not always, but most likely will get grades between 70 and 80. They're a C student. Um, what, how should we give these kids grades? Should we always tell them, you got 71, you got 72, you got 78, you got 79? Um, how motivating is that? How motivating is it to get grades within the, your range of ability, but always know that you're a C student. So far from our analysis, and we didn't do the, the full set of experiments as much more to, to study, this is just not very motivating. Uh, these kids, uh, no matter what grade they get, if it's 71 or 79, they always feel very much behind. They always feel that they get bad news. You're, right? you're a C student, you're a C student, yes, slightly better C student, or maybe a B minus. But, but you're not really at the top of the class. What would happen if we gave them grades that are relative to themselves? Right? Um, would, would they find more interest? Would they become more motivated? Uh, would they understand better uh, what they need to do? Would they care more uh, about this? So I don't have the answer yet, but, but you can see how you were starting with some information about something like weight, and then we're taking this to other, other places and saying, what is the theory of information as it comes to motivation? And should we change, uh, should we change what we're doing to include uh, other sources to motivate uh, kids uh, to a higher level? And I, I think the answer eventually will be, uh, will be yes, uh, but, but we, need, uh, we need to do, to do more of that. Okay, so that was uh, project uh, uh, number two. <clears throat> uh, 
The third project I, uh, I want to tell you about is uh, about uh, trust. Um, as you know, um, COVID is a, a problem with, with biology, right? There's a terrible uh, uh, virus. Uh, but, but it's not just a challenge of uh, biology, it's also a challenge of uh, human decision-making. It's also a challenge of human behavior and uh, in lots of ways, right? We need to um, get ready to change our habits. Uh, we need to learn to live with different kinds of stress. There's economical changes, lots of things are happening. <coughs> but with all, with all the things that are happening, one of the real... Uh, questions is is trust uh, how we trust uh, the people around us uh, trusting the government and so on so uh, I, I want to first kind of give you a, a general story on on kind of a game that we play to to portray why this is so important I'll say something about building building trust so so there's a game that, that we call the public's good game. The public's good game. And, and it's, a, it's a really good metaphor for life, for lots of things in life in general, but also for, for COVID-19 and trust. And the game goes like this. Uh, we pick 10 random people in the US and call them in the morning and we say, hey, uh, we're going to call you every day for the next year and every day we'll give you $10. And uh, you can do one of two things with these $10. You can either keep the money for yourself, in which case you'll be $10 richer, or you could put the money in a central pot. And all the money that all the players will put in the central pot will grow up, will grow during the, the day five times. In the evening, distributed equally by everybody. Okay, so how does this game work out when you play it for real? You call 10 people, you remind them the rules, and on the first day, everybody puts their money in. Almost always, everybody puts their money in. 10 people each get $10, they all put the money in. 10 people, $10, $100. The money grows five times, $500, equally divided by everybody. In the evening, everybody gets $50. And life is good, and it continues like this for a while. People wake up, they get $10, they put the money in. In the evening, they get 50. Everybody's very happy. And, and this is a metaphor for what happens when we work together, right? And, and the idea is that together we can do things that we can't do individually. If we pull our resources together, we can achieve great things. We can uh, build schools and hospitals and roads and invent new vaccines and do all kinds of things if we pull our resources. And everybody's happy. And then at some point, and it always happens, one person decides not to put anything in. So people put, 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 and one day, one person decides to be selfish and not to put anything in. What happens on that day? On that day, nine people put their money in, $90. The money is multiplied five times, $450, equally divided by everybody, including the bastard that didn't put money in, and everybody gets $45 from the common pot. But the bastard that didn't put anything in has $55. Why? because they have their $10 from the morning and they get money from the public pool. Uh, that's what's called freeloaders, right? People who don't pay taxes, for example, or people who don't participate in the public good. They just take the resources like everybody else, but they don't participate uh, themselves. So, so that's what happened on that day. What do you think happens on the next day and the next day? Basically, it goes down to zero. And, and it's not, it's not uh, and, and the other thing about this is that you have um, these two stable mechanisms, these two stable solutions, what's called equilibria. There's an equilibria, a stable solution where everybody puts money in and everybody is gaining. And there's an equilibria where nobody puts money in and nobody is gaining. There's nothing in the middle that is stable. The moment one person doesn't put their money in, it deteriorates to zero. It doesn't stay at five people putting money in and five not. If it's either 100% and then it's stable for a while, one person betrayed goes to zero. And the good equilibria where everybody participates is very weak. 
It's enough for one person to be traced and the whole thing deteriorates. The bad equilibrium is very stable. Imagine it for three months, nobody puts money in. Three months, nobody. And then one day, for some reason, three people put money in. What happened the next day? Does it go up to 100? No, it goes back to zero. And, and this is a metaphor of how important it is for everybody to work together. Now, if you think, for example, uh, in Israel, uh, we had this huge challenge that uh, during Yom Kippur, a lot of the Orthodox communities uh, did not adhere to the rules, right? They did not adhere to the um, uh, uh, social distancing masks, uh, stay at home uh, rules. As a consequence, uh, there's no question that the hospitals are going to be uh, flooded uh, by people from the Orthodox community, and it's going to basically um, a burden uh, the whole healthcare system to a degree that I hope they will be able to manage, but it's unclear that they will be. So you have a group who said, we don't care about the public good, we'll do just what's good for us, and then the whole thing will deteriorate, and of course, there'll be long-term uh, ramification uh, for that. Okay, but let's go back to uh, let's go back to trust. Um, if you think about the, the public good problem, um, it's always true. It's always true. Um, paying taxes, right? If somebody decides not to pay taxes, they are hurting the public good. COVID-19 is extra important from a public good perspective. Why? Because if in a regular day, 10% of the people don't pay their taxes, we have 10% less taxes. But if you have 10% of the people not adhering to COVID-19 rules, it's not just 10%, they can destroy it for, uh, for everybody, everybody else. Um, okay, so this is kind of the importance of adhering to the public good, uh, playing together. Another question is how do, we, how do we make it happen? How do we increase trust? How do we get people to, uh, to care about this? Uh, so first of all, I'll, I'll tell you uh, my favorite study on, on trust. Um, in this study, uh, imagine I'm a waiter and I come to you and you're a table of four people and you're the first one I go to and I say, what would you like for dinner? And you say, I want the fish. And I say, ah, you know what? The fish is not so good today. Take the chicken. The chicken is cheaper and better, cheaper and better. Um, and then we measure how much the people around the table take my advice. The second, third, and fourth person take my advice. And how much the whole table take my advice for wine? And people take the advice to a very high degree. Case number two, I come to you. What would you like? You said you want the fish. And I say, ah, the fish is not so good today. Take the steak. It's three times more expensive, but it's amazing. Now, how much do people now take my, take my advice? Now, the answer is not so much. Now, what's the difference between the first waiter and the second waiter? Uh, what's different is that the first waiter made it clear that they have our best interest in mind, the, the diner's best interest in mind. He said, take something better and cheaper, good for you and worse for me. Now, the second waiter said, take something more expensive and better. It's good for you and good for me. Now, maybe this was a good advice. Maybe the second waiter gave you an advice that is just amazing, that you would be happy with forever, that, you know, just amazing advice. But you would never know. Why? Because you don't know if they're acting for themselves or for you. With the first waiter, it's very easy to, to tell. <clears throat> so what is the point here? The point here is that when we want to create trust, we have to basically make sure that we are willing to give up something from ourselves that people know that we have their best interest uh, in mind. Um, so for example, um, when our uh, czar of Corona, uh, Gamzo, uh, got his job, uh, we got to uh, talk a lot. And uh, my uh, recommendation, one of my recommendations was uh, to ask our representatives, uh, basically the members of parliament and our members of the government, um, uh, the ministers, to basically be very clear about them adhering to the corona uh, rules and agreeing in advance 
to take to to accept double the fine if they ever violate something right you want to say basically we uh, care even more we're willing to take uh, on ourselves a, a rule if i tell if i tell you here's a rule that i want you to adhere to but i'm not uh, adhering to that's a very bad uh, signal if i say i'm adhering it to a higher level that i'm demanding from you uh, that's a sense of uh, something that is uh, trust creating. Of course, I uh, I failed um, miserably in trying to convince the government to take on uh, this kind of uh, approach. Uh, but but that's the thing that uh, the kind of thing we were trying to do um, to create uh, trust. Uh, we also asked people to um, start a new uh, contract. Uh, we said today will be different, we'll start something else uh, that also was very effective for a short time until it became clear it wasn't a really, um, it wasn't a really uh, new contract. Okay. Um, there's lots of other topics that we've attacked over the years. Kaima has been around for, for about four years and we, we've been trying to uh, reduce government bureaucracy uh, to get more uh, orthodox men and women uh, to to study and uh, to stay in school. Uh, we've tried to get uh, more people who are going to engineering colleges uh, to stay in school. Uh, we've tried to get people to do preventative uh, healthcare uh, to a higher uh, degree, uh, reduce diabetes. Um, Lots of things on education, of course, these days. Uh, how do you do distance education? How do you create uh, autonomy for the teachers, for the uh, principals, for the kids? Uh, we're now um, really examining uh, what are the rules of um, roles of uh, examinations, and to what extent is our exams actually promoting education versus not? And can we find other ways uh, to promote that? Um, uh, trying to uh, measure well-being, trying to figure out uh, healthcare, lots, lots of things in, in all kinds of uh, all kinds of directions. Um, we have a really good collaboration uh, from the government in general. Of course, uh, these are these are complex times, and those are the kind of things that we're uh, interested. In. So uh, I'll stop here, and if there are any uh, questions. I'm happy to take uh, questions about what we do at Kaima, about uh, social science in general, COVID. Great. Thank you so much. So much to take in and digest. And I know I have a lot of questions and we had some that came in, so I'll start with some of those. But we do have some time now. I want to encourage everybody, all the participants, to, to type in your questions in the Q&A box and we will try to get to as many as we can in the next little bit of time that, that we have. So, so a question came in about how can we use behavioral tools for things like Jewish engagement? Is there a way to use these principles, for example, to get people to study? And um, I think you touched upon that a little bit of in what you do at Kaima, but if there, is there more to elaborate in some tools that could help with Jewish engagement? Yeah, so, so I would say the following, in, in general, um, every time we approach a problem, uh, we start with the assumption that we don't know much about what is really going on. We basically suspend the belief that we understand what is causing certain kind of behaviors. And then what we do is we start by trying to understand what is holding people back. Uh, and what's holding people back could be lack of knowledge, lack of interest, it could be time, it could be all kinds of things. So we do a deep analysis of what's holding people back. And then we ask questions about, and what could motivate people? Uh, so in a very, very different uh, world, there was a study that looked at, there was a piano company, uh, organs, uh, electronic organs, that they were uh, trying to figure out how to get um, people at retirement to start playing. And they did a factory in Florida and they failed miserably uh, so then they started having a happy hour 
uh, not, not with alcohol, but with cookies and tea. And lots of people came, they came for the cookies and tea, but then uh, they also uh, learned uh, to play the, the piano, the organ, and um, they, they were very happy uh, with that. So the first thing is to figure out what's holding people back. And then the second thing is to, is to figure out what is motivating to people. And I think in Jewish studies, there's lots of things that could be motivating. Is it about the sense of community? Is it about uh, personal growth? Um, is it about a pure interest in, in uh, education? Uh, I, I don't know what, uh, what it is, uh, but, but I would say that it's, it's not that I have a suggestion of what to do, but I think the structure of our approach of saying, find barriers first, find things that could motivate later on, think about how you make them into a habit. Those are the same steps that I would take for a lot of things. I would, I would do the same thing for um, getting people to exercise and I would do it for uh, studying, studying Judaism as well. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And so what do you think the limits are between using these tools as social scientists or behavioral, behavioral scientists and psychologists and being manipulative? In, di in different ways of getting people to do what you would like them to do. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I think it's, it's your intention. Mm. Uh, so, you know, manipulative is, is about doing something that people really don't want you to do, uh, where I try to do things that people in principle want to do, but not today. So, you know, if, if I came, um, let's say with the weight loss program that I told you about. And those people basically want to improve their health. Uh, it's just that on a day-to-day -day basis, it's tough. Uh, so I, I think of it as basically helping, uh, helping them. Um, but let's say I did something else. Let's say um, I took, I took um, let's say I took workers, uh, and I got them to uh, work uh, two more hours a day and spend less time with their families. And when you ask them in principle what they really want to achieve, they said, oh, I really want to work less hard and spend more time with my family. Then I would think of it as manipulative. But if I, in general, it doesn't have to be everybody, but statistically, if most people in my group are generally interested in that, then I feel comfortable with what I'm doing. So I have to convince myself that it's for their benefit and they're interested in this, and then I'm really comfortable. Um, I will tell you that I have used my own knowledge for things that are um, sometimes are manipulative. Um, mm -hmm. uh, this has been more in the area of uh, how Israel, for example, deals with its enemies, right? So when you think about uh, people on the other side, um, then you have a different sense of uh, what's okay and manipulative. So, so uh, anyway, the, the ethical questions, the ethical questions about knowing social science and using it are, are complex. And you have to always ask yourself, are you, are you using it in the ways you mm -hmm. want to use it? Interesting. I think that's such a that's such a listen everywhere. Also, with our, with you know, we're a Jewish funders network, and with funders, or they use what's the intention of where they're funding, and to think through the tools that we might have, and and how we can best utilize those tools in a way to really create, create good change. I see on the chat, people want to buy the scale that you were talking <laughs> about. So, if you want to let people know where they could get that, I know a lot of people, especially right now, would love some help with that. Um, so we have a few more questions we'll try to, we'll try to tackle. So Kaimala uses revolutionary approaches in so many different ways. And you were talking about the government, um, you know, has used to do things in a very different way than that. And how do you try in the work that you do in all over, how do you try to convince them to try the approaches that you see work so well at Kaimala? Yeah. So, you know, what, what, what NGOs uh, usually do is they have a mission and they promote their mission. Mm -hmm. uh, they donate money, they, they create programs. 
and then they hope that at some point the government will take over because no philanthropist wants to stay in their business for forever. They want to do a proof of concept to show things are working and then hope the government will, will keep on taking it from there. Basically, our approach is very different. Uh, we start with the government. Uh, we look at the things that the government already wants to do. And we basically propose to them to inject some science into it. And it's amazing. It's amazing how many decisions at the government level are, are made with, with no data. And sometimes they have no time. There's all kinds of reasons for that, but they're just not, this is not their field. Right. And so, so we start with things that we know the government <coughs> already wants to do. Um, and then we said, let us study this, yeah. find out and, and propose something that is more likely to work. And it's, um, it took us some time to build trust. Um, but, but now we have it. And now we're deeply involved in, in lots of things. I'll give you one more example. Um, there's a law in Israel that if an em employer wants to hire an employee with a disability, uh, they get from the government money back for adjustments. Like if you need a ramp for a wheelchair or braille machine or whatever it is. Only what, as you know, uh, the government is always afraid that people would cheat it. So bureaucracy is very, very high. So the process can take more than a year um, to, to get the money back. And many uh, employers don't even start because they know it will take more than a year and it's also very time consuming. Mm -hmm. So we said, let us do a study in which we will make the process very, very short. And we made the process two weeks. So in two weeks, you get the money. You take um, a video of the work environment before, you hire a contractor from a list of approved contractors, you take a video of afterward, mm -hmm. you get the money, that's it. Now, do I think that people would cheat us? Yes, but it's a cost and benefit. Like, I don't want the, the process to be two years, like a year and a half to get the money back and nobody's cheating, but, but nobody's hiring people with disabilities. Um, so uh, we're, we're basically getting the government to do lots of experiments. Um, yeah, like this. And, and I think for all philanthropists, it's actually a good question to think about what is your view on when the government will, will take on your project. And, and the way we are starting is we're starting with a very high likelihood that that would happen because we're starting with something the government already wants to, to take place. Um, for example, this class I told you, they already want it to happen. It's really important to them. So it's, it's a very high value uh, of time to spend money on that because it will not just happen, it will happen soon. Mm. Great, thank you. Thank you. Another question that came in is more, um, I guess, personal. In how, from a psychological perspective, many experts say our brain are like computers, that they have been programmed since childhood to behave in a certain way. How do we reprogram our subconscious and conscious brains to improve our habits when we're fighting against years of programming? Is it possible to make major changes within a year? I know that's a big question and away from some of, some of the case studies we were talking about today, but, but I know people would be interested in your views. So, so I'll give you two very different answers. The, the first one is like, you know, very, very severe, serious daily training like meditation does work. Uh, a few years ago, I, I met with the Dalai Lama. You know, he has a lot of ideas about how training the brain uh, works. At the end of our meeting, I asked him if he would give me some monks uh, for testing. He said, no. <laughs> uh, so, so, you know, there's a limit to, to what, what we know about that. But, but I still think that there's um, some things you can get. Like the training is brutal. It's tough. It's difficult. It's time consuming. But there are ways to do it. Mm -hmm. And what meditation does to a large degree is to separate the experience from the emotion. So you see a cookie and you see a cookie. And the emotion is kind of separate. And, and mm -hmm. that, that's one thing. My approach as a social scientist is usually very different. And for me, it's all about designing the environment for better outcomes. So um, 
So if you're used to um, snacking at night, um, you know, I would just say, don't buy those snacks or uh, lock your refrigerator or, you know, do, do something else. So, so we, in general, uh, we believe that human freedom resides in our ability to change our environment and make our environment more conducive for better health. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to go walking, don't just tell yourself that you want to go walking and set up an appointment with a friend to go walking together. You will not want to disappoint your friend mm -hmm. and you'll show <laughs> and you'll show up. Or if you think about um, dieting, you know, set up things that are easy to do. We talked about friction, like make the right behavior, the easy behavior. So, so, I, I think that if you think about what we can do, most of what we can do is change the environment. Um, we can change our work environment, we can change the school environment, uh, we can change the world bank accounts. Look like. <clears throat> I'll give you one maybe last example. You give people a budget and a credit card and they overspend. Credit card just goes up, 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 and people overspend. You say, spend $2,000 a month on discretionary spending, and they spend way too much. Mm -hmm. You give them a prepaid debit card, it goes from 2000 to zero, they uh, adhere to it more. Mm -hmm. You put the money on weekly, $500 a week, people stay more in line because they see the consequences of their action. You load the, Monday, the money on Monday rather than Friday, people are even better. If you go on Friday, you spend too much on the weekend. Mm -hmm. Lots of things are about tools. What tools are we designing? And you know, if you think about the tools for the physical world, right? We have uh, chairs and rugs, and we have forks and knives and crutches and planes. I mean, we've designed lots and lots of tools uh, to deal with the world. Uh, our mental tools are very, very much behind. So for me, it's about what kind of mental tools are we creating for people? And can we create mental tools for improved performance? And I think the answer is yes. And we've showed it in all kinds of ways, but we need to create more of those. Okay. Thank you. Uh, this is really a lot to, uh, to try to think about and answer, especially during this time of, uh, of uncertainty to try to create those tools within our own personal life and then within our professionalism and our funding and our funding interests, so some tools that we might have had that works, we have to readjust and think through some of those steps that you were saying about some of the easy things that maybe we can adjust that can be helpful. Um, we only have about a minute and a half left, so I wanted to really leave it open to, to you for any kind of closing, closing thoughts about the work that you're currently doing with Kaima or some of the other work that you are involved in that can you know, help, help close this conversation and center us a bit? So I would say as following, with, with Kaima, uh, right now a lot of our work is uh, in education. Uh, distance education is a tremendous challenge, tremendous importance, um, also some on domestic violence. And that, as you probably know, is increasing around, around the world for all kinds of terrible reasons. Um, yeah, we do need help. Um, it used to be that the government uh, used to cover some of our costs, not all of it, but some. Uh, that's becoming more and more challenging uh, with the, the way the Israeli government is functioning uh, right now, or sort of functioning right now. Um, so if, if at all you're interested in uh, following up and maybe help us um, uh, with some of our uh, research and uh, policy work, we're always happy to, to talk to more, uh, more partners. And I would say, you know, this uh, COVID period is going to last for a while. It doesn't look like it's uh, going to go anywhere. And in whatever funding initiatives you do, um, I, th I think that um, adding a little bit of research to what you do is probably going to be useful. Uh, mm -hmm. First, a lot of our assumptions about what's working and not working are, should be questioned. Uh, right now, uh, money is, is tighter, uh, using it in a, in a better way 
is probably uh, very important. So whether you want to help us with Kaima uh, or not, uh, when you think about how you are spending your own philanthropic mm -hmm. money, it's probably a good idea to uh, think about some evidence-based to make sure that you're spending your money in the right way. And um, if, if you want to talk about a measurement or evaluation or something like that, I'm all, also happy to try and help. Great, thank you. That's really good advice. And, and thank you for being so generous and being open to uh, connecting with people if they have more questions. Um, people can connect with me and I can you know, help make sure that people are, are able to get in touch. So Dan, thank you again so much for your partnership. This hour flew by again. We never have enough time to, to dive into everything that we would want to dive into. So thank you so much for being with us and, and teaching us and sharing your wisdom. And um, thank you to all the participants who were here today. And we look forward to coming back together again and learning again in the future. Thank you. Stay well, everybody. <laughs>